uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be back here. So as uh, Emmanuel Ulmo said, I was here for uh, twice two months uh, and I enjoyed, uh, enjoyed a, a very uh, uh, productive uh, stay here at EHS uh, this year and, uh, and last year. Now, um, uh, I have to confess right from the beginning that what I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, in fact, has nothing to do with, uh, I guess, signal transmission and uh, information technology and no Shannon. So uh, I'm a little bit... <laughs> Sorry? It's okay. It's, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in that sense, uh, but you know, it's, I, I, I couldn't. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I never worked on, uh, on on these subjects. I mean, there will be uh, uh, randomness coming up, uh, uh, but uh, but in quite a different way than um, than in the previous talk. So uh, so this being uh, this being said, so I mean, now it's after lunch. You can relax. It has. Uh, <laughs> it's not important for, for this uh, for this program. So um, uh, so I, I I want to um, I want to start by um, telling you what uh, kind of uh, I mean starting with a historical example, what uh, uh, what uh, uh, what one understands by random medium and what one understands by effective behavior, and briefly mention. Uh, what uh, what more recent applications might be in that area, and uh, and then I want to uh, uh, I want to address um, uh, two specific issues we've worked on, and uh, uh, so one of them in a certain sense is motivated by uh, numerical analysis, so really understanding the uh, uh, the numerical errors a very popular ubiquitous engineering method. Uh, Makes and the second uh, the second topic uh, has to do I mean uh, now if I would be bold I would say it has to do with uncertainty quantification so understanding the uh, uh, the error uh, uh, one is making uh, or understanding the fluctuations the uh, the amount of uncertainty characterizing the amount of uncertainty in in solution with random data okay so here is by the way th that's this probably a pointer also at the same time. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, this is, uh, as I said, kind of a uh, um, um, historical example. Uh, probably that that's that's the first time uh, in the physics literature uh, uh, a problem in, uh, in in effective behavior of uh, random media was posed and solved in the uh, in the famous work of Maxwell of, uh, on electromagnetism, and uh, and he was interested in. Uh, a kind of effective conductivity or effective resistivity. And uh, so in, in the back of his mind, he had the following situation. He had a kind of a slab uh, of a conductor, uh, a homogeneous conductor, so a homogeneous uh, conducting medium. Uh, and he was imposing uh, uh, a voltage difference uh, between the bottom and the top surface. And uh, uh, as, uh, as we know, since the medium is homogeneous, uh, this uh, voltage difference leads to a uh, homogeneous current field, which here is indicated by the green arrows. And there is a, there is a proportionality between, uh, uh, between the, uh, 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 the strength of the, this uh, homogeneous current field and the voltage drop uh, divided by the height of the slab. And that's, uh, that's a material constant and that's the, uh, the conductivity of the uh, of the material, or one over that constant is the resistivity. So that's uh, that's kind of, in a certain sense, the nice homogeneous situation. And then he was imagining uh, 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 a slab not formed of a homogeneous material, but formed of a heterogeneous material. So a material where you have uh, 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 which is made out of two bare materials, where where let's say you have a, a background uh, matrix which is made of this material with, uh, let's say, spherical inclusions of another material with another bare conductivity K1. So you have kind of a mixture of a material with conductivity K2 and with conductivity K1. And clearly, uh, since uh, this material is no, no longer homogeneous, even if the uh, voltage is kept constant down here and kept at a different constant up here, the, uh, the current which you get is no longer constant. The current density is not constant in fact, will be some complicated, uh, uh, some complicated vector field. 
But, uh, but nevertheless, uh, uh, you imagine that, uh, or Maxwell imagined, or Maxwell knew, that uh, if, uh, if this, the height of the slap was large compared to the typical distance of these inclusions, so if there was a clear scale separation between the characteristic length scale of the heterogeneity and the length scale of the sample, then this heterogeneous behavior in fact behaves like an idealized homogeneous behavior in the sense that there is a clear proportionality between, uh, between the voltage drop and the average current which, uh, which flows, uh, flows through the sample. And, uh, and then uh, back then, of course, uh, uh, you couldn't resort to, uh, to a computer to uh, determine that uh, effective behavior. So he made the assumption of a dilute regime. So he made the assumption that the typical radius of these droplets is much smaller than their distance. And in this dilute regime, he was able to actually derive, theoretically derive, uh, an asymptotic formula for the effective conductivity of this mixture in terms of the bare conductivities K1 and K2 and in terms of the volume fraction P. So that's, uh, that's a first example of such a kind of, uh, in the physics literature, of finding uh, the effective, even identifying an asymptotically correct formula for the effective behavior of a random medium. So nowadays, uh, uh, people uh, are interested, or people don't want to uh, kind of uh, restrict themselves to situations, to these dilute situations, where uh, you can, you know, in a certain sense, you can understand the behavior at least asymptotically by paper and pencil, but they, uh, they want to treat, let's say, realistic uh, uh, situations like, uh, like the permeability of a porous rock or the elasticity uh, properties of, uh, of a certain mixture here, it's carbon and polymer. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, since there is no diluteness here, they have to really resort to numerical simulations to uh, extract from kind of the, st the, s the specifications of the statistics to extract the, uh, the effective behavior. And the, uh, the, uh, the engineering method which, uh, which is used is the method of the representative volume element. And that was uh, uh, the starting point for Antoine Gloria and myself. Uh, we, wanted to, uh, we wanted to understand the error one makes in that method. So it was, uh, in fact, uh, that was a question which I heard from Wayne and Eux. Uh, that uh, there was still some work to do to understand that from a, uh, from a more mathematical or rigorous point of view, what, uh, what are the errors made in this very common method. So, um, uh, so, so uh, uh, what I want to do in this talk is I want to uh, first tell you this story. Uh, so uh, kind of the, uh, the error analysis of this represent... Uh, first I'm going to explain to you what this representative volume method is. And then I'm going to tell you what, uh, why it would be interesting. It is interesting to have an error analysis and what the error, uh, error analysis is. And then, uh, and then I want to, uh, I want to uh, 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 go to, I mean, if I have the time, still address a second uh, issue, which has really to do with the uh, characterizing the fluctuations of the solution, characterizing the fluctuations, in this case, of the current field and uh, and uh, uh, so uh, uh, characterizing the, uh, uh, the variances. Okay, so let's start with, the, uh, with this representative volume element method. Uh, so uh, the, um, from a mathematical point of view, uh, the, this heterogeneity, heterogeneity of the medium is described by a coefficient field or a tensor field. So uh, something which uh, expresses the possibly anisotropic microscopic conductivity of the medium or whatever material property you're interested in. And, uh, and typically in these applications, that's a uniform elliptic, uh, uh, as we say in PDE theory, a uniform elliptic uh, coefficient field or in differential geometry you would say a metric. And, uh, and then once you have this metric, you can form a kind of the, a differential operator. We call it an elliptic differential operator, which, uh, which governs, uh, which, in, which, which contains the physics. I mean, for instance, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you stick to the field of conductivity, uh, uh, this, uh, this operator acting on a function would be equal to zero if U is a potential that leads to a stationary current. And um, 
So that's from mathematical point, that's the abstraction, that's what we're dealing with. And, uh, and now, uh, now in random media, uh, you have in a certain sense incomplete information on how this coefficient field looks like. So you, in a certain sense, you just have statistical information, which anyway you think is much more appropriate than the detailed, uh, uh, detailed uh, uh, local information. So mathematically that means you're not working with a single coefficient field, but you're working with a probability distribution on the coefficient field. So the coefficient field is a random field, so something which depends both on the position in space and on your realization. And, uh, and throughout the talk, it's perfectly fine to keep the following uh, simple example in mind and the numerical simulations which I'm going to show to you are based on this example. So we call it kind of Poisson type uh, uh, example. So, uh, so think of your space, uh, Rd, d-dimensional space, think of d equal 2 or 3. I mean, in the numerical simulations I'm going to show to you, it's a two-dimensional, but theory doesn't care for the dimension. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so the red points here uh, are uh, distributed according to the Poisson point process in all of space. And uh, then uh, around every of these points you draw a ball, you, uh, you consider the ball of radius, uh, let's say one quarter, if the density of the Poisson pro pro point process is one, which means roughly speaking the distance between the points is a, on average equal to one. So then you look at the union of all these balls, that's the blue set, that's a random set. And then you, uh, as a very simple example, you take this coefficient field to be equal to one times the identity on the blue region and lambda times the identity where lambda I think is one over 10 in the experiments, so some other, some number different from one uh, on the complement. So that's a very simple, that's a very simple example of, uh, of such a random coefficient field. So how, so right, before I go to this slide, so, so, so here you have a, here you have a simple, a simple uh, very easily, or, I mean a, a random medium which is described in very simple terms, right? I mean it's just uh, in a certain sense you have three parameters. You have the uh, kind of the number density of the Poisson point process which I arbitrarily uh, set equal to one. You have the radius of the balls which I choose to be one quarter. You have uh, kind of the contrast of the medium, which uh, let's say is one tenth, so a factor of ten, and uh, and that's it. So you have three uh, three parameters, and uh, and now you want to extract the uh, this effective behavior, the effect on large scales, the effective resistivity or conductivity of this medium, and uh, so in a certain sense you want to go from three parameters to uh, another finite number of parameters. So, uh, uh, so you start with something very low, the very low dimension description, and you want to get extract very low dimensional information, but the map is not explicit. So there is no simple formula which would relate these three numbers to the uh, uh, d square numbers uh, uh, you're interested in. So, uh, so therefore, what uh, what's done in uh, in engineering is this uh, uh, representative volume element method. So in order to get uh, an idea of what that is, uh, it's really good to think in terms of this physical application. So uh, the functions, you should think of the functions as electric potentials. Uh, the negative gradient then by Maxwell is the electric field. Uh, the coefficient field has the meaning of conductivity. So if you apply, if you multiply the electric field by the conductivity, you get the electric current and the current is stationary if its divergence vanishes. So, uh, um, so what's, the, uh, what's the purpose of the effective behavior, the effective conductivity of the medium? It should provide a linear relationship between the average <coughs> potential gradient to the average current. So uh, the microscopic conductivity is the proportionality between the, uh, uh, the ever between the local field and the local current, current and the effective behavior should give you the relationship between the average, the spatially averaged field and the spatially averaged current. That's, uh, that's what, what, uh, what, what, this is, uh, what this is supposed to be. So how do, uh, how, do, how do engineers this in practice? They artificially introduce some finite sized domain, so the simplest thing is to think of a torus. 
So they introduce some, uh, some box and identify boundaries. And, uh, and then in this finite, uh, in this finite sized region, uh, they sample their medium according to the same specifications as in the whole space. So, uh, uh, so they look at the Poisson point process with the same density on the torus and, you know, exactly the same things. So, uh, so now you have kind of sampled what you think is kind of your right statistics, but not in all of space, but in the torus. And then they solve uh, D, where D is the dimension. So in two dimensions, just two simple partial, linear partial differential equations uh, uh, on the torus. So they seek a kind of a periodic function phi i, which solves this elliptic differential equation. So uh, perhaps I can write this on the blackboard because that's, uh, um, that's important. So you take the gradient of xi plus phi i, and uh, this, uh, this is supposed to be periodic, and you want this to be equal to zero, and of course I can write this here as ei plus gradient phi i, where ei is kind of the i-th uh, unit vector. So, uh, uh, so, and this, uh, this function is called the corrector because it does the following thing. You may also call it harmonic coordinates. You start from the affine function in the i-th coordinate direction and you want to correct it in such a way, so you uh, add to it the function phi i, that the resulting function is harmonic. So this is why sometimes these coordinates are called harmonic coordinates or why this is called a corrector. So that's, uh, that's, the, problem, uh, that's the problem which you solve. And then, uh, then you take the, uh, the current which belongs to these harmonic coordinates, so this expression, so the field multiplied by the conductivity, and you average it over the torus, and that is what you take as approximation to your uh, homogeneous coefficients. So let me also well, let's write it here. So a hom ei So that's what the uh, that's what's done in uh, uh, that's uh, that's the uh, that's the representative uh, that's the representative volume element method. And here is uh, here is an numerical uh, uh, simulation to just show give you flavor of what you're doing. So you're picking uh, a coordinate direction here. We pick the first coordinate direction in our two-dimensional model. So uh, so we're looking for a potential, which is a periodic perturbation of the potential that linearly grows in x1 direction so that its current is divergence free. So here you see the potential lines. Clearly they're kind of dense in the region where you have a low conductivity and they're sparser in the region where you have a high conductivity because there it's more like a conductor where the field should be expelled. And that, those are the flow lines. That's the current which belongs to this. And now you take this vector field, you average it over the torus, you get a vector, you get two numbers, and that's the first row of the effective behavior. And now you do the same thing in the second coordinate direction. So in this case, kind of the level lines will essentially be horizontal. horizontal. The gradient will be mo mostly pointing in the E2 direction. You get the same thing, uh, 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 and uh, you take the average of this field, and, uh, and you take this as the, uh, as the second row of your matrix. So that's... Uh, that's exactly what, uh, 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 what you're doing here. And um, so, by the way, uh, it's not surprising that this number here is exactly equal to this number. Kind of the symmetry of the resulting matrix is in a certain sense built in. And, um, <coughs> and now the question is, how much should you trust these numbers? And, uh, and intuitively, it's clear that you shouldn't trust these numbers if this, rep if this representative volume element is too small, then it certainly has nothing to do with the effect which you would capture. So these numbers should become better and better the larger this representative volume element becomes. 
And that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that's kind of the error analysis we were interested in. So, uh, um, uh, but, uh, uh, but before saying that, one should, or before turning to this, one should uh, kind of also point out that the answer which you get here is a random answer because it depends on the realization. So it's not yet a deterministic quantity, but it's a random answer. It's very clear that uh, if you sample your medium once more, you will get a different solution and therefore you will get a different aver average. So this is still a fluctuating, a random number. But on the other hand, it's also intuitive that as you make the size of this box larger, and here I didn't draw it as a larger box, but I rescaled it back to unit length and made the ball smaller, that's mathematically equivalent, the variance should go down. So that's, uh, that's what we call the random error. And that's indeed what, uh, what one sees in, in the numeric simulations. So here uh, you have three different realizations of the random medium. Of course, uh, you get three completely different solutions, three completely different current fields, and three quite different matrices. They differ, let's say, by 10%. So the, that's what I said. I mean, the answer which you get is a, what we would call a random variable because it depends on the realization. But if you go, um, uh, so here again is, is uh, what, we, what we saw before. But if you do this, uh, the same simulation with a much larger representative volume element, then you see that the fluctuations clearly go down from about 10% to about 1%. So the question is, yep, yeah, go on. Do the results uh, rely on the assumption that there is percolation of the Boolean model? Or? Uh, they don't rely because um, uh, th that's not necessary here because we didn't put the conductivity equal to zero in the complement. If, uh, if, we, would, uh, if we would allow this, uh, remember that uh, this, uh, this coefficient field uh, was, um, was defined to be uh, equal to the identity and equal to uh, lambda here. And I think lambda was chosen to be 1 over 10, but positive. If, uh, if, the, if this lambda were allowed to be 0, then, ex then you would get in the situation of percolation. And that's, of course, also a well-studied uh, well problem. But uh, it's not, uh, uh, I'm kind of, uh, because that, of course, has additional difficulties or additional challenges. I'm not addressing that in this talk. So here, so therefore percolation, whether it's percolating or not, will play a qualitative, I mean, some quantitative role, but not a dramatic qualitative role. Does that answer the question? Okay, so, um, so, but that's only one type of error. There's a second error, which is slightly more subtle, namely that even if you kind of disregard the fact that this is a fluctuating quantity, a random quantity, by, for instance, taking its expectation, it still would not be the right value uh, ev uh, because of the following phenomenon. Um, when, you, when, you, when you go to the torus, you've kind of falsified the statistics. You've, uh, if you, if you un unwrap your torus into the plane, I mean, you have kind of a periodic coefficient field, which means you've introduced kind of spurious long-range correlations. Instead of having a Poisson process, You've, uh, you, 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 you're looking at a different, uh, you, you're actually looking at the wrong statistics by doing this. So that's a systematic error, uh, kind of a bias. And, uh, and also that, if, that effect one's, one's seeing. So if we're just looking at the, uh, at the expectation of this quantity, of course, numerically, we, we're looking at the empirical average. But uh, let's say we, uh, 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 Ronald Kriemann did many, many uh, samplings so that, this, that we actually access uh, the expected value. We know that uh, because of symmetry considerations that it's isotropic, so it's just about this number. And then even this number, so even after taking the expectation, still depends on L and only converges to its final value as the size becomes large. So there are two, there are two types of errors involved in this problem. I mean, there is kind of random error, which comes from the variance of the answer, and there is a sy systematic error which has to do with the wrong statistic, with, with kind of the wrong, with using the wrong ensemble. And, um, and of course, so qualitative theory, which is 30 years old, 
tell us that both types of error, uh, errors go to zero. And in fact, we have a nice, uh, 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 nice Pythagoras rule in, in probability space. Uh, the, square ex the, the, the expected square error is the sum of the square of the random error plus the square of the systematic error. And uh, both of them go to zero. And now we were interested in at what rate do these two errors go to zero. So why, 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 why is that uh, kind of uh, a question of practical importance? Because it depends, uh, it, it would determine what type of numerical algorithm you're using uh, uh, for this, uh, um, uh, when you want to infer the effective behavior. Because you have, uh, when, you, when, when you do that, when, when an engineer does that, he has two knobs to turn. He can either look at a, a few very large samples or he can look at many moderately sized samples. And uh, it's clear that uh, looking at many samples will only affect the random error. It will kind of attenuate the, 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 the damaging effect of the random error. It will have no effect on the systematic error. So, uh, so therefore, in order to find the optimal, I mean, if you, if you have a certain number of unknowns to spend because you don't want to wait three years, but just three weeks to get your result, you have an optimization here. If you want to reach a certain error, uh, uh, you, uh, you can either do it this way or that way, and which way is the better depends on the scaling of these two, uh, of these two errors. So therefore, this is a, this is a relevant, uh, from a numerical point of view, relevant question. And of course, since it's a relevant question, uh, people uh, have uh, kind of uh, uh, looked at this um, for a while, but it's only since fairly recent years that kind of one got a, a satisfying and optimal answer. Just let me mention, because it came up in the previous talk, the mathematical tool by which we get many of these results, in fact, is the logarithmic Sobolev inequality. So we're using in kind of an infinite, we're using concentration of measure logarithmic Sobolev inequality to get some of these results, but I will not mention, I won't talk much or will not talk at all about the, uh, the methods here. So, uh, so the final result, uh, the final result we're getting is the following. Uh, the random, the systematic error is much, much smaller than the random error. The systematic error, uh, I point out the difference, here is a square, there is not a square. So the systematic error is about the square of the random error. So it definitely pays to look at many, many realizations because you have to first make sure that you make this effect, the bad effect of the random error small by looking at many realizations and only then you have to worry uh, about the systematic error. And, uh, and by, uh, since, since we wrote this, uh, kind of uh, uh, the uh, things have uh, kind of progressed. Uh, by now one even understands that the, uh, the fluctuations are approximately Gaussian, so even the error uh, not only has the scaling, but it also has its own structure, and that's uh, that's a little bit what I uh, what I want to uh, uh, what I want to uh, um, to talk about uh, in the second part of uh, my talk. How much time do I still have? Still have like half, like twenty minutes or so. Okay, so that's much more than I will need. So. Um, so the first part was about these kind of uh, error estimates for, uh, for this engineering method. And the, uh, and the second part is uh, about the fluctuations of the solutions. So, uh, so that's uh, now changing a little bit uh, perspective. So, uh, um, so why, does kind of, why does homogenization pay? Why does kind of this, uh, this theoretical concept pay? Well, it's related to a separation of scales. And that is something which I already mentioned in, in, in the context of Maxwell's ex example. His separation of scales was the separation between the typical size of the domain, which was the width of the slab, and the typical size of the medium, which was the distance between the inclusions. So, uh, so we have a macroscopic scale, which is either set by the size of the domain or by the characteristic size of the right-hand side of the equation, and kind of the microscopic scale which is set by, uh, by the medium itself. So the diameter of the balls, the typical distance between the balls. And let's set this one equal to one. So we non-dimensionalize in this way. So we have this, uh, 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 this scale separation between a large geometrical external scale and this much smaller intrinsic scale. 
And uh, now let's think of uh, the simple elliptic equation with the right-hand side f. So we, we put this length scale into the right-hand side, which means we're looking at the right-hand side, which varies on a very slow, on a very large scale, which we call L, and whose amplitude we scale like this, so that the amplitude of the solution is of order one. So, uh, so homogenization tells you that instead of solving this very complex problem, where you would have to, at the same time, resolve the small scale of the coefficient field and the large scale of the domain or the right-hand side, you can solve a much simpler equation with the effective behavior with the homogenized coefficient there. So qualitative homogenization tells you this fluctuating solution, this random solution here in blue, is in fact pretty close to uh, this non-random, uh, non-oscillatory solution. And, uh, uh, and of course, also there, you want to understand uh, what is the error. And in fact, uh, uh, in periodic homogenization, that's very well understood. Kind of the typical fluctuations happen on scale one, and the typical deviation from the limit is of the order of one over L. And in fact, the same is true in the, um, in the random case. And uh, so, uh, so when you really want to quantitatively compare the solution of your heterogeneous equation to the solution of the homogeneous equation with the effective behavior, you go back to this object, to the corrector, because that helps you to understand the error. So here again is kind of this schematic picture which I drew here. So the, uh, this, these functions phi i correct the affine behavior uh, in such a way to get a solution, to get a harmonic coordinates, to get, a, uh, to get a solution of this equation. And now therefore, instead of comparing u directly to u bar, you should compare u to a modulated version of this corrector. So that's what I tried to explain by this picture. So uh, down here, you have the true solution, and uh, which kind of oscillates around the homogenized solution. And in fact, you get a much better approximation uh, of the true solution by taking the tangent to the homogenized solution and by doing this construction on top of the tangent. Then you get something where also the gradients are close, not just the solution. And in fact, the relative error is like in, uh, um, like in uh, periodic homogenization. So here, you wouldn't see the effect of randomness in a certain sense. That's a result which tells you uh, random homogenization is not worse than periodic homogenization. But in fact, there is much more structure in the random case. And that has to do with the fluctuations. And that's uh, uh, the, the story which I want to tell last. So, uh, so let's suppose you were interested. Uh, so here again is, is our, our, uh, our solution of the heterogeneous problem, which we don't really want to compute. So we seek kind of theoretical understanding of it with the right-hand side, which has the right scaling. And let's suppose we're not interested in the solution in an extremely point-wise way. We're not interested in understanding the solution in every point, but we're just interested in standing, understanding certain macroscopic observables, like in oil recovery, what's the kind of mean flow rate or so. So, uh, so macroscopic observables would look like this. You would take some spatial average of your solution U, and the spatial average is on the same scale as the solution, so on this macroscopic scale L. And uh, now the question is, can we get a better understanding of the fluctuations of this quantity? So that's now getting a bit in this uh, business of uncertainty quantification. Can we understand, can we not just understand the size of these fluctuations, but can we really characterize these fluctuations? So uh, a while ago we found out that uh, they have uh, the order which you would expect from center limit theorem scaling, so 1 over LD. So you see that this is kind of very different than the previous error estimate, uh, where in a pointwise sense the difference is 1 over L, and here it's uh, the, the averaged error is like more like 1 over L to the power D over 2. And, and that of course means that the next natural step was, well, can we understand the limit of this quantity if we, res if we put it onto the right scale? Can we, characterize, can we characterize these fluctuations? And, um, and the first thing uh, we, and now we meaning kind of the, the small communi community that's looking at these problems, uh, was to plug in 
the uh, two-scale expansion, so the way that you get a pretty good approximation to your uh, uh, heterogeneous random fluctuating solution by doing this construction of taking the homogeneous solution and modulating it with the corrector. That was the first guess. And then, uh, then you would be drawn to understanding the covariance of the corrector. So, uh, so the therefore, what we first looked at uh, was kind of getting a better understanding of this, this object here, the covariance structure of the corrector. And together with uh, Jean-Christophe Mourat, who is a probabilist in Lyon, we, uh, we were able to kind of uh, 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 show that there is a limiting covariance structure on large scales. And, uh, and that it's, uh, in a certain sense, uh, uh, even we could characterize it in some way. It has, uh, it has the homogeneity of, uh, of the Green's function. So uh, here is kind of, here's the covariance function in blue, and that's the, uh, that would be the, uh, the homogeneity of the Green's function. So it's homogeneous of order minus d over 2. So, I mean, he was a probabilist, and of course, if you see something where an object, a random field, where the covariance structure is the one of uh, the Green's function, you think of the Gaussian, white, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian free field. But in fact, it's not the Gaussian free field. It's not equal to, uh, the covariance structure is not equal to some, uh, uh, some, uh, some Green's function. So that was the first uh, interesting finding. It's more subtle. And then uh, Jean-Christophe Mourat with uh, Gou from Stanford uh, even found out that the uh, what motivated us in the first place to look at this quantity, namely the fact that we could understand the variance of any solution by looking at the variance of the corrector, is not as simple as that. Because both of these limiting kind of variances exist, but they're not equal. So it's not, it was not the right uh, idea to use the two-scale uh, two expansion in the simple way in order to reduce the, uh, the variance of any solution to the variance of the corrector. So that was a little bit of a puzzle. We don't quite understand the, uh, uh, the covariance structure. And then uh, very recently with uh, Mitzia Duranx, uh, who is a, a PhD student of Antoine Gloria in Brussels, uh, kind of we, uh, we found what I think is the right way uh, to understand these, um, these fluctuations, at least to leading order, and to, uh, to characterize them. And what we, what we introduced is something which we call the homogenization commutator, an object which is built on the objects which anyway you have to compute on the correctors. And it looks at the difference between the current and the field to which you apply the effective tensor. So it's a very simple object and we call it a commutator <coughs> because uh, in a certain sense it co it, it's, it's the difference between uh, immediately applying with a microscopic, uh, microscopic conductivity or you know, doing the homogenization and then applying with the microscopic, uh, 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 with, the, with the effective conductivity. And that's a random matrix field. And the first observation is a completely deterministic one, namely that the fluctuations of, uh, of our observable can be in a pathwise, in a pointwise way described by this kind of played back to this quantity, to this capital Xi, to this uh, homo homo homogenization commutator by solving an adjoint problem. An adjoint problem, remember that yeah, G is kind of the observable we are interested in. We're solving an adjoint problem on the homogenized level that defines the V-bar. And if we have the U-bar, which is the homogenized solution, and the V-bar, we can, to leading order, with a kind of precise relative error, characterize the fluctuations. And the second part of the finding was that this strange object, or which is not that strange, <coughs> on large scales behaves like white noise. Like, uh, like Gaussian white noise. So if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the correlation function of this object, of this tensor-valued object, and you put it on the right scale, then essentially you see, just see a peak at the origin and then a flat uh, zero, uh, a zero uh, uh, So in large scales, this homogenization commutator behaves like white noise, like Gaussian, necessarily then Gaussian white noise. So it's characterized by, sim by a single four tensor it's a four tensor because this ab object was a two tensor, so its covariance is a four tensor. And if you put these two results together, you get uh, a complete asymptotic uh, characterization of the variance in terms of, this, uh, in terms of this new object Q, which describes the covariance of, uh, of that thing. So, uh, uh, 
So that's, uh, that's the, uh, uh, I think, nice and also pleasing characterization of the limiting variance. And it's uh, the nice thing from a practical point of view, the nice thing, the, the message in a certain sense, you know, in America I would say the take home message is that uh, if you're interested not just in the solution, but you're interested in the fluctuations, in the variance, in the variances, because you're interested in uncertainty quantification, you don't have to do any new work because uh, anyway, to get the homogenized, effective homo homogenized uh, behavior, you had to resort to your representative volume element method. You had to solve for these D, uh, uh, for, you had to solve for the harmonic coordinates. You had to find the harmonic coordinates. You had to solve these problems about which I talked in the first, in the first uh, part of the talk because they give you the effective behavior, or at least an approximate effective behavior. But if you have these objects, then you might as well look at the capital Xi, at the homogenization commutator, or at least on the approximate level. And you may look at this uh, Green-Kubo type formula, which is, uh, which is a proxy for uh, their covariance structure. So without any additional numerical effort, uh, you have access to, if you, if, you, if, you ha if, if you want to get a hum, you automatically, without any additional effort, you have, effort, uh, you have access to this, uh, to this four tensor Q, and with help of this four tensor Q, not only can you characterize the leading order, the leading order behavior of your fluctuating solution, you can also characterize the leading order behavior of uh, the variance of uh, observables. So therefore, so I, I think this is, uh, I, so I would hope that this is uh, um, an insight which, uh, which, uh, uh, which can, be, uh, can be used in, in, in practice. So that, uh, that brings me to the summary. So, uh, uh, so I mean, what, uh, what, uh, what we've been working on uh, quite um, extensively in the past years is kind of making this type of homogenization of random media more quantitative. And here I, I, I've given you, given you two, uh, two examples. I mean, understanding the error in the representative volume element method and, uh, and an example of, uh, if you want, uncertainty quantification to, uh, to leading order, which turns out to, uh, to not, not uh, be computationally more expensive than what you have to do anyway to get the, uh, the effective, uh, effective behavior. So that's, uh, that's it. <laughs> Is there any questions or comments? Uh, <clears throat> so, f first a question. So, you, you have uh, uh, discussed fluctuations at the level of uh, the central limit theorem essentially. Can one use the same techniques and work out the large deviation uh, scale uh, to see what happens to? That's uh, uh, that's a good question. I think um, um, to some extent that can be done, and uh, and I think uh, that has also that had that in parts had already been tackled by the uh, by the probability uh, um, uh, community. I mean, uh, one one piece of information which I uh, which I uh, which I didn't mention here is, I mean, we characterize the variance, and we know that they're approximately Gaussian. So there, uh, but uh, but as you say, kind of looking at the uh, large deviation scale uh, is is another type of question. So my feeling is that this could be done, and that this is in parts done uh, already in the uh, in the probability community, but that this requires different types of uh, types of techniques. And a second question is, yeah. uh, since you alluded to <coughs> in the, the first slide this limiting uh, rare. Uh, perturbation, so uh, very few balls. Yeah. Can one also use uh, this uh, Maliavin expansion uh, to, to, to get, I mean, first order, second order, and perhaps an expansion with a sort of chaos expansion uh, on the Boolean model? So, uh, so, so now you mean an expansion in the, uh, in the volume fraction? Uh, yes, in, in the intensity, which is. Yeah. And uh, so I think that has been done. I don't know, I don't think it has, so, so, uh, uh, two of my co-authors, so Missia Duranx and, uh, and Antoine Gloria, have in a similar model uh, looked exactly kind of they, they, um, uh, uh, they, they've proven uh, kind of, uh, I mean, they, they've sh shown that this is an analytic function in the volume fraction and kind of developed, uh, if you want, some kind of multipole uh, 
uh, way of, uh, of getting, getting to all the series. So that can be done, not with the Malia 20, not with these tools. I mean, we, in most of our proofs, we use, if you want, something like Malia 20 calculus, uh, because we're taking the derivative with respect to the noise, which in our case is taking the derivative with respect to the coefficients. So we, we, we try to understand how solutions, and that's a, at first a completely deterministic question, how sensitively a solution at this place depends on changing the coefficient at this place, which is described by the non-constant coefficient Green's function. And that's really computing the Malyavin derivative, and that then we put into kind of concentration of measure, logarithmic Sobolev inequality machinery to get, uh, to get most of the, many of the estimates.